So welcome back again to Introduction to Criminal Justice. Today we're discussing the development of policing. So we have to begin with the foundation of modern policing. Uh, what you'll see is the foundations of modern policing aren't really that old. Um, again, the more modern ones. The idea of an administrative unit, right, responsible for ensuring uh, its members adhere to the law, uh, first emerged in the ninth century, right, when England's Alfred the Great organized the country around family groupings. They called them shires. Royal an administrative unit, known as the shire or sheriff, assumed responsibility for its members. So when you think about this, um, kind of in a modern context, it was basically Alfred the Great kind of made counties, very large counties. Um, and generally speaking, the land was usually taken care of, used, etc., cetera, uh, by members of the same family. So it's usually a large family group. And then we appoint one person or, or, or the administrative unit to ensure that everybody in the family unit is, is adhering to the law, um, is acting properly, right? And the sheriff or the sheriff, they assume this responsibility. So that being said, uh, if we jump forward quite a bit, by the 17th century, law enforcement was broken into four distinct segments. So we had magistrates, parish constables, beadles, and thief takers. So magistrates were, and what they are still today, we sometimes still call them magistrates. Um, they were essentially judges. Uh, they had the power. Um, they could issue um, arrests, they, uh, warrants, they could, uh, they would question suspects. Um, they really kind of had a blended role between policing and courts. Um, again, we're not really at the point where we're too concerned about due process. Um, we're rather just deal with the issue. So magistrate kind of played in both parts, um, but for our purposes, I mean, he was, he was more of a, a judge than anything else. That being said, the person responsible for policing um, certain areas would be known as the parish constable. Right, so each parish, if you go to Louisiana, they still call counties parishes. Um, so again, think about it kind of in a county context. So parish constables theoretically were supposed to enforce the law. Um, in reality, they didn't have much power, like at all. Um, again, that's where the magistrates came into play. And so if, if parish constable wanted to do something besides some minor thing, they would have to get it from the magistrate. So that's where we kind of start to see due process starting to form, right? Of we have somebody who has, there's a, there's a check on their, their power. So parish constable is not really the most effective um, policing unit, but each, theoretically, that they, they were responsible for uh, making arrests and doing basic policing. Now they were assisted by beetles, well, they were called beetles. Uh, they were constable assistants, and their whole job was to basically harass the homeless, right? So they would remove, and I th you think your textbook uses this term, and I, I don't like it, um, it's a, not a good term, vagrants from city parks, right? They would just, um, I mean, their, that's their whole job, was, was to harass the homeless. So you have parish constable doesn't have a whole lot of power. He's being assisted by somebody who's only there to harass the homeless, make them move. Um, magistrate still has most of the power, right? And then we see the introduction of what's called thief takers. So thief takers had no real legal standing um, in the sense that they didn't have the power really of arrest. 
uh, that was explicitly granted to them. Uh, they acted more as bounty hunters, what we consider today as a bounty hunter. Uh, they would track people down, bring them to court, get a reward, and also somewhat kind of patrol the, 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 the area. Um, so thief takers were very independent. Um, they, there was no like club or group. Um, you didn't have to sign up to be a thief taker. You didn't have to go through any training. You just like one day woke up and said, you know what, I'm going to start getting people who are wanted. Um, obviously in today's context, that's much different. Um, bounty hunters or bail enforcement agents is like, is the, is the new term they like to use. Um, they are usually required to be licensed by the state, right? So the state has to recognize them. Um, they might have special training requirements depending on the state. And if they wanna carry a firearm, which is a really bad idea, um, they have to get all the proper permits to do that. So that's kind of the concept here with thief takers. Um, they weren't governed by much law, um, if any, right? So they didn't have to register. They didn't have to do anything. Uh, they were largely independent. Now, you did have some groups who teamed up um, and kind of started to form um, organized groups. So it took a while, though. Right, so when we get into the mid 18th century, a person named Henry Fielding uh, actually laid the foundation of the modern police force by organizing a group of thief takers. Right, so Henry Fielding uh, was basically appointed to be a magistrate, uh, and he, in his magistrate capacity, got a group of thief takers together, organized them, um, and they were known as the Bow Street or Bow Street, you want to say it that way, runners. Um, so he was in charge of the Bow Street runners and, and they would, and they were fairly successful uh, for being the real first organized group of thief takers. Now keep in mind, we don't have organized policing, right? It, it's, it's, there's just little power here and there. Um, and this is the mid 18th century, right? So, not long ago, um, when you think about policing, right? You think policing would be something that is this really long history. Um, not true. Uh, policing is is relatively new. Um, but that's this kind of laid the foundations for future generations to say, okay, and and, and for others to say, okay, we can organize, and if we organize, we're gonna have more power uh, and we're gonna be more effective in policing. So that being said, if we jump ahead to the early 19th century, so we're talking 1828, a person by the name of Sir Robert Peel, so he was knight, later knighted um, for his, what he did, introduced a bill in parliament that created the first organized, centralized police service, London's Metropolitan Police, All right? So again, 1828 is the first time that we actually have a police organization, a police service. And I say we, I'm talking in England, um, I, that, that always blows my mind, right? You think we had the Revolutionary War, Declaration of Independence, Constitution, and we didn't have a real police force, and the world's first police force was in 1828. Wow, like just putting that in context, that, 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 that kind of blows your mind. Um, I will say this, so if you do travel abroad, you go to England, um, and different parts of London, it's just like New York, uh, there's different parts, good, bad, etc. Um, but, they refer to police officers there, like we call them cops, right, in the United States. That's kind of our slang term for them. Instead of saying law enforcement official or police officer, we say cops. Um, sometimes it's disrespectful, but usually it's just kind of the vernacular, right? Um, 
in England, they still call police, uh, police officers, um, peelers or bobbies, right? Um, obviously, peeler derives from Sir Robert Peel, right? Um, the London Metropolitan Police Force, they, they lovingly adopted the term peelers, right? Because it was peelers bill um, and, and peelers idea and why not? Uh, excuse me, peels bill. And then we have the term Bobby, right? Um, that used to be used in conjunction a lot with um, the police officers in London who still like, who at the time, and this was a while ago, wore the hats that kind of looked like a bucket um, before they wore where are the, the, the flat caps now. Um, they were called Bobbies, right? Because Sir Robert Peel, Robert, what's the nickname for Robert? Bob, right? So we go to Bobbies. Um, and that's just in the vernacular, right? Is, is, is they say, oh, there's a Peeler or, oh, there's a Bobby. It's like us saying, hey, there's a cop, right? Um, so this really kind of starts, and it actually has a good foundation, um, 1828, right? So keep that, 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 that date in mind. So that's England. All right, 1828. If we say, um, or if we move to uh, the United States, we have kind of a really different perspective. Um, so there were divisions in policing within the United States and they differed by both time, period, and location. However, we can trace our police departments, our police officers, our policing style to England, right? So at the time in the United States, again, so this is post-revolution in the United States, um, states that were former colonies often had large groups of settlers from the same country, right, or people of the same background. And, and then the idea was um, one, an English or a language thing, um, but also it, it's, a, it's an identity thing, right? So um, if you've ever heard the term Pennsylvania Dutch, right, Dutch settlers went to the Pennsylvania colony. For the most part, I mean, they went other places too, but that was kind of their hub. Um, when we think of Pennsylvania, we think of the Dutch. Um, and what they brought, right, after we have kind of policing starting to form, um, they brought constables to their settlements, right, Dutch settlements. Um, and unlike the, the previous constable, um, the constables in Dutch settlements in, in the United States had full arrest authority. Um, they were, um, they could make arrests, but did they, or did they have a routine basis? Not, not so much. And we're gonna talk about why here in a second. Then we had the sheriff, right? So this definitely derives from England. Um, again, they had shires and sheriffs, so you take that and, and, and put it into um, context, right? It, it, it becomes sheriff. So it's the first formal law enforcement to appear in territories, right? So basically anything east or excuse me, west of the, the Mississippi River was a territory um, and it was patrolled um, in small communities and small areas by the sheriff right? Um, if it was very large and very, very large, um, then we had territorial agencies, right? So think of, you know, Texas was a territory for a long time, right? We had the American-Mexican Wars and, and, and it, it's not great. Um, like, yeah. 
Um, that being said, we did get from this group the Texas Rangers, right? Um, as law enforcement group, and, and they still exist to this day. Now, in the United States, the Texas Rangers are the fort first organized police force, or organized force. Police is, a, is an interesting word, but they're the first organized group, right? So even the United States were trying to organize like England had organized. But we were so spread out, right? And we had different settlements here and there. There wasn't a whole lot of intermingling. Obviously, if you wanted to go to another town, like you couldn't just get in your car and drive 10 minutes and be there, right? It'd be a day trip just to get to the next town. So really there, there, was, there was policing um, that happened at the local level as well. Um, and that's kind of where the majority of it happened, right? So constables, Dutch elements, sheriffs, first formal law enforcement, they're sworn um, to uphold the law, um, and, and they patrol uh, like they do today. Um, so sheriffs patrol the county, right? Local matters are, are left to city limits, but anything in the county, the sheriff theoretically has control over or, or jurisdiction over, right? So we had that as well, um, but we're talking large territories, like we're talking Lewis and Clark territories, uh, Louisiana Purchase territories. We had ter territorial agencies, again, the Texas Rangers being the first. Then we also had federal and town marshals, right? So the federal marshals, um, they were responsible for essentially bringing fugitives to justice. Right, um, and if federal marshal sounds familiar, it's because they still exist. So federal marshals, uh, they're an amazing group. If you can get into the federal marshals service, um, uh, they're they literally they're they're whole they're, they have two they have two purposes in modern day. First purpose of the federal marshal is to track down fugitives. Right, so if somebody doesn't show for federal court or you know, skips town, whatever, um, breaks out, the federal marshals are responsible for finding that person. Now, again, you, we still have bounty hunters, right? And so you have basically two groups looking for the same person. The federal marshals, who it's the, just their job, they arrest them, they put them in the back, and, and they take them to, to court. Um, whereas if you get popped by a bounty hunter, the federal marshal can still take that prisoner away from you. Um, so bounty hunters like try to be convert and try to get to um, the courthouse in such a manner that they get a reward um, or, the, or the bounty that was put on this person. That was federal marshals. Um, they, again, theoretically forced federal law, uh, but really up until the 14th Amendment, um, federal law, uh, fed, at least the Constitution, did not apply to the states or territories. So that was kind of the, the jurisdiction of the federal marshal was to bring fugitives to justice, right? Because we were so spread out um, that all you had to do is, if you want to commit a murder, go commit a murder in Pennsylvania, get on a horse, ride two weeks to Texas, and nobody will ever know. Right, there was no internet, there's no criminal records, you didn't change your name. I mean, nobody knows, right? So that's why we had the federal marshals. They were very, very good detectives. And then we had town marshals. Um, they kind of aligned with constable duties, uh, but they were more of just keeping the peace, right? Um, and, and, and in enclaves. That being said, um, 10 years following the creation of London's Metropolitan Police Service. In 1838, Boston established America's first police service. Right, so we had territorial agencies, they were kind of the first organized force, but again, they're not necessarily policing. The first police service to service a city, to enforce the laws of the city. Um, 1838 in Boston, 
right? Um, it's not that long ago. Shortly thereafter, um, New York City got on the, the, the bus, if you want to say it that way. Um, so, right, this, this is a period, 1830s, 1840s, where we have a lot of immigration, right? You know, um, this is kind of the, the, the American dream immigration, right? Um, going through Ellis Island and all that stuff. So we have a lot of immigration. Um, and most of the, the settlers who came in this time period actually resided and, and left and stayed, I should say, in New York City, right? So they would get on a ship, they would go through Ellis Island, all that jazz, and then they'd be released in, into um, New York City. Well, that's where most of them stayed. I mean, there were definitely immigrants that moved different places and, and, and all that jazz, but it was kind of like, well, everything's here. This is the biggest city, right? All of our needs can be met. And more importantly, um, if you go into Boston, this, this is true for Boston as well, um, New York, neighborhoods there have cultural identities. Um, and when I say that, I say that basically neighborhoods um, are made up of certain you know, ethnicities. Um, so if, if you go to one part of New York City, right, one neighborhood, like a big neighborhood, uh, it might be people who are of Italian descent, right? You go to another neighborhood, it may be people of Irish descent. Um, and so on and so forth, right? Um, if you ever want the best um, pasta, uh, you go to uh, Boston and to the uh, Italian neighborhoods there, it's amazing. Um, but they keep that tradition, they keep that identity, right? So it was the partially like, we're moving to a new place where we don't know anyone, but we wanna keep our traditions, our customs, so we kind of group together. That's partially how the different boroughs in New York City form, right? Um, which just kind of naturally through um, immigration. But that being said, at this time, there was also fear of crime and social disintegration. Um, so you had people who were United States citizens, right? And they saw immigrants as threats, right? Um, and, and, you know, some immigrants were bad. Most weren't, some were. Um, but there was a perception problem, right? It's kind of, it, it, it's weird that it kind of mirrors today, right? Where we think that there's disintegration and where fear of crime is rising um, and, and, and we're challenging immigration issues. That's what they were doing then, right? So, there's a lot of pressure in New York City, and New York City in 1845 uh, organized the first 24-hour, seven-day-a-week police service. All right, so Boston, like they only worked days. At night, you were on your own. Um, New York City, 1845, um, basically said. No, <laughs> like we're going to patrol and, and be there 24-7. So 1845 is when we get the first 24-7 police department in the United States, right? And again, think about that. That's not that long ago, right? This is way after the Constitution, right? I mean, this is, this is not that long ago. So let's jump forward a little bit in time. Um, past the 1800s to kind of what modern day structures of policing looks like. So despite its relatively recent invention, um, most or modern policing has swept most modern westernized countries. Right? So there are still countries that don't have this conception of modern policing or police forces, um, or the preferred term now in England is police service. Um, but most Western countries do, 
Um, the ones that don't, they may rely on family units and family discipline. So this is very true in, 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 in Southeast Asia. Um, you have what unfortunately amounts to many kings or basically warlords um, in different parts of, of Africa. Um, and they have soldiers and the soldiers are responsible for kind of policing. Um, so again, modern policing it's, has swept westernized countries, but in countries that are still developing, um, it doesn't, it's not necessarily there, right? So um, if you do travel, that's something to keep in mind uh, where you're going. Do they have an active police force? Is the police force corrupt? Is it a good police force? A lot of questions that you need to ask uh, before you go somewhere. Because God forbid you get out there and you need help, right? Or somebody steals your passport or something like that. You need to be able to go to somebody, right? Um, warlords don't give it two cents about <laughs> your passport or anything along those lines, right? Um, other countries adopt restorative justice, but that assumes that we know who the perpetrator is, right? Um, so again, and it's not to say that Western, uh, non-Westernized countries or developing countries are, are bad or, or that they are um, somehow primal or anything along those lines. It's just a recognition that that structure doesn't exist yet. And it can be because of their tradition or it could be because of logistics. I mean, there's a thousand reasons why police departments don't necessarily exist everywhere. Now, that being said, if we think about the United States, um, we think about professional police agencies, right? So we're talking federal, state, and county, city. Um, we actually don't know for sure how many police departments are in the United States. That's a little embarrassing because it's 2020, like, and I feel like you can send out a survey and just be done with it. But we estimate there are between 23,000 and 25,000 public sector professional police agencies, right? So we're talking about as, as agencies, um, what they can do and, and, and things like that. Um, but again, we don't know the exact number. So we gave it a 2000 window, and that's, that, that, that's, that's another thing that's baffling to me. How do we not know this, um, right? Especially in the day and age of the internet, just have them fill out a form. I, it, it just, it, it baffles me. Um, that being said, because we have so many police agencies, right? And again, at the different levels, federal, state, county, and city, um, Duties and authorities may sometimes be very vague or exceedingly broad, right? Um, which is never good. If something's vague, that means the, or, or exceedingly broad, um, if something's vague, that, that leaves the interpretation of how to enforce the laws to the individual officer. If it's exceedingly broad, then we worry about trampling on constitutionally protected rights. And we will have a lecture later on um, that deals with restraining the police in terms of what constitutional rights they have to abide by and, and acknowledge. Um, that being said, there's also significant overlap between the, the, the police jurisdictional authorities um, as most jurisdictions have several layers. Um, or police authority. So way to think about it is in, in the United States, you can define it as three or four. I say four, some people say three. They combine county and city um, and they call it local. I, I split them up because they have theoretically different powers. So in the United States, at any given time, sitting where you are right now, you are governed by federal law. Right? So if you go out and you commit a federal crime, federal agents will arrest you. You'll be tried in federal court. 
And that's the other thing marshals do. Marshals also serve as the security guards for federal court. Basically, when you're young, you go out and you capture fugitives. When you get old, you go stand in a red coat in the federal courthouse and get paid a ridiculous amount of money to say, oh, courtroom seven is on the third floor. Um, when I worked for the Court of Appeals, U.S. Court of Appeals for Judge Terea, um, I got to know the marshals really well, and their stories are awesome uh, about what they did. And then, you know, I asked them, so, so why are you still doing this? Because they, I mean, they are old. Like, the, I, they're kind of there as, as a token um, because they don't, like, if you look at them, you really think, okay, you're going to stop a gunman? Like, no. Uh, like, you're barely getting out of that chair. Um, like, that's how, like, how old we, we were talking with federal marshals. But federal marshals make six figures a year. Um, the longer they've been in, obviously, the, the more money they have. Um, and they also get federal pensions. They get federal um, benefits, health benefits, everything. Like, it's amazing. So if you're considering law enforcement, definitely consider the U.S. Marshals. That being said, at the federal level, that's where we have the U.S. Marshals. Uh, that's where we have FBI. Um, and we'll take a look at some, some other uh, groups in a second. Right? So you're governed by federal law wherever you are in the United States. Now, wherever you are listening to this, you are governed by state law. So if you're sitting in your chair in front of your computer in the state of New York, you are governed by federal law and state law, right? So if you go out and you break a state crime, you get arrested by a state police officer and charged in a state court, not a federal court, right? Um, there are, in New York, um, counties that have their own legislatures, uh, which is something that, that is, is odd to me, not being a, a New York native, um, but they have ordinances and cities pass ordinances. So wherever you are, you are governed right now by at least four, arguably five, um, different sets of laws, right? So federal, state, county, city, and if you wanna think about it this way too, international law, right? So they overlap, um, jurisdictions overlap, uh, and they can cause issues, right? So what happens if you commit a crime and the crime is, uh, let's say, kidnapping, right? And you do it down here, um, right next to the Pennsylvania New York border. Uh, you kidnap somebody and you take them across the border, all right? Couple things. One, you have broken New York law, right? Kidnapping is criminal in New York. Two, you have broken Pennsylvania law because it's illegal in Pennsylvania as well. And three, you've broken federal law because kidnapping is a federal offense. So the question then becomes, who arrests this person? Who tries this person? Who puts this person away in jail? Who? Um, usually we kind of defer up, right? So um, states usually take the lead on most things, uh, but that's only if basically the feds say, no, we're not gonna deal with it. Um, you can have it. Uh, there's kind of a deferral up the list, right? So the city will defer to the county, the sheriff. Um, the, the, the sheriff will defer to state law enforcement, state troopers, and then state troopers will defer to uh, federal law enforcement, FBI, et cetera. So um, it can create nightmares. Um, I will tell you in my scenario I just gave you, Constitutionally, it is perfectly legal. It's not a violation um, of the Constitution for New York to try you for and, and, and try you and imprison you for kidnapping. And then the day you get out, Pennsylvania arrests you, tries you for kidnapping. And the day you get out, the feds arrest you and try you for kidnapping. Um, so yeah, be careful where you commit your crimes and know what kind of crimes you're committing. Because one crime just got you three separate prison sentences. Um, so it, it's just something to kind of keep in the back of your mind. 
when we're talking about the organization of policing, right, and, and jurisdictions. So again, federal, again, the FBI, state, Superior Bruce County, Sheriff, City, um, Elmira Police Department, and again, at the international level, there's really no international police force. Uh, there are international laws that we are, we have to abide by. Usually they apply to countries more so than individuals, um, but theoretically individuals can break international law. Uh, you all have probably undoubtedly heard of Interpol, right? Um, and Interpol's red notices and red warrants and things like that. So I'll tell you this, Interpol is not a police department. Interpol doesn't have agents. Interpol is basically a processing center, right? So what happens is they process and they deal with fugitives who flee countries and they go to other countries. Uh, and they work with the International Criminal Court, the ICC, in prosecuting or, or, or issuing warrants um, for people who've committed things like genocide, uh, war crimes, etc. Right. So you get an Interpol red notice. That means that's a, that's basically an international arrest warrant. A red notice basically says to every country, um, well, that abides by the Interpol or belongs to Interpol and, and abides by the ICC Rome statute. Um, they have the power to arrest, right? So um, if you take my human rights law class, we're gonna look at uh, human rights violations in uh, Pinochet, uh, the dictator Pinochet. So Pinochet went to, was, was sick, went to London um, to get healthcare um, because again, his country didn't have any and, and that was his fault because he's a dictator. Uh, and he's getting healthcare at a private hospital. And we think, okay, this is our opportunity. Because here's the fun fact you can't arrest somebody with a red warrant in their own country. Right? So as long as he stayed in his country, the red warrant, nobody could touch him. But when he left his country and he went to England, then we can effectuate an arrest. England had the power and the duty to effectuate the arrest. Um, so Pinochet goes in for surgery, basically wakes up handcuffed to the bed. And like, what the hell? Uh, Interpol had issued a red notice, a red warrant um, for human rights violations. Um, then they, the, it's a big long story. It goes to the House of Lords and the House of Commons. Uh, they debate back and forth whether or not um, they should arrest, have him arrested, to turn him over, to try them themselves, and, and it was just this big nightmare. Um, Pinochet was also really good friends with Margaret Thatcher, who was the prime minister at the time, so that didn't help the situation. Um, it really does become just a, a clusterfuck. Um, but it's, it's a, I have a documentary or, or a, a, a movie that, that follows what happened. Um, it's, yeah, it's crazy. But theoretically, if there's a red notice for you, any country can arrest you, right? And then return you to the ICC or, or wherever. Um, usually red notices aren't issued for international fugitives. So people who go from the United States to Canada, right? Probably not gonna get a red notice. Red notice is usually reserved for like war crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, et cetera. Um, so that's kind of where we're at in terms of the structure of modern policing. Now this just gives us an idea of the hierarchy of law enforcement, right? So if you can see, and it kind of goes down into two models. Um, you start at the top with federal law enforcement, right? So federal law enforcement is the alphabet soup, right? It is, turn this other way, uh, it is the FBI, the ATF, the DEA, DHS, IRS, USM, and more, 
right? That's all that would fit on the slide. That's federal law enforcement. Um, basically, federal law enforcement, their job is to enforce what's called the U.S. Code, right? So that's why I said you, don't, you, you have to abide by federal law. You have to abide by the U.S. Code. Um, the agencies that enforce federal law are highly specialized, um, highly, highly specialized. So for instance, we have Federal Bureau of uh, Investigation. They generally have a, a, a broad range of what they can deal with. But if we move down to the ATF, um, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, they can only deal with alcohol, tobacco, and firearms and the violations of that. Uh, DEA, Drug Enforcement Administration, only deals with drugs. DHS, Homeland Security, deals with Homeland Security issues. They kind of have a broad mandate. This one probably shocked you. The IRS. You can actually become a special agent for the IRS um, if you want to go into policing. You're a federal agent. It means you get a lot of money and you work for the IRS, so you're probably not going to get shot at. Um, you'll get cursed at and stuff, but it, whatever. Um, IRS agents make arrests, right? So if somebody hasn't paid their taxes, um, IRS can get a warrant and has send out a IRS special agent to put handcuffs on you and take you to court. Um, so again, that's another thing if you're considering uh, law enforcement and you want to be safe, IRS is the way to go. I don't know of any IRS agents off the top of my head that, that, that have been killed recently um, by any means. Um, the IRS is usually really willing to work with people. Like if you haven't filed taxes in 10 years, you say, I haven't filed taxes in 10 years. Like you're gonna get all kinds of penalties, but like as long as you're working with them, they're not gonna send a cop after you. And the USM is you know, the United States Marshals and um, federal court security. Generally speaking, federal law enforcement agencies are under the supervision of the DOJ, right? So if, if you ever look at a logo for the FBI, you'll see that it contains reference um, the Department of Justice, right? So th theoretically, the, all these groups report to a courts, it does everything. Um, it's the um, agencies doing random things. We coordinate, we coordinate from with the Department of Justice who kind of orchestrates how we deal with stuff. Um, and again, that, that DOJ includes the U.S. Attorney, so it includes prosecutors, includes anyone um, really in, in, in that, that capacity. So if we jump down, right, um, the next level down is state law enforcement, right? And this is where I talked about the New York State Police. So state law enforcement formed in the early 1900s, right? Um, especially, I mean, New York uh, formed in, in the early 1900s. Now there are two models, right? There are the highway patrol model and the general police powers model. So I grew up in Missouri. Missouri abided by the highway patrol model. What did the highway patrol do? What were their powers? Basically the only real power unless they were invited in um, or somebody requested help from them, all they could really do is literally patrol the highways. Um, they didn't patrol in towns, they didn't patrol anything like that, they just patrolled highways. So, so anything that went between two counties. Um, so, the, I mean, they're the ones who pop you for speeding, right? Um, that's their job, is to pop you for speeding um, and other like vehicle infractions, right? And, and of course, this also includes logistics and, and, and semis, they all fall under this model. Um, I, this is the one that I always joke about, um, on the side of, at least on, in Missouri, on the side of their patrol cars, 
the Missouri Highway Patrol had written to protect and serve. And I was just like, no, your job is to generate revenue for the state. Um, like, you're not really doing much other than that. But hey, that's that's their model. Um, and you don't want to get popped by a state trooper because they're expensive and they're not nearly as understanding as some others. Uh, at least in Missouri. Now, in New York, what you have is a general police powers model. So New York, state law enforcement can come in and basically take charge of any ongoing investigation. They can make arrests and in investigations. They can do whatever, right? They have general police powers. So as long as something occurred in the state, they can take over and they can run the show. Um, they have that luxury. Now, generally speaking, when we're talking about highway or law enforcement, state law enforcement and, and New York State Police, uh, New York State Police generally don't get involved in crimes or uh, making arrests, investigations, et cetera, uh, unless it's like homicide or, or something very serious. Um, that being said, uh, recently, um, New York passed a law that basically said if a, a, a sexual assault occurs on a college campus, one of the contacts that the, the, the survivor is given um, and one of the notifications that gets made is to the New York State Police, right? So instead of having county law enforcement or local law enforcement investigate a sexual assault on a college campus, by law, the New York State Police have to investigate a sexual assault on campus. So if you ever see state troopers parked in, 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 in the lots, which I have a lot, you know why they're there. Um, and, and usually they don't leave without somebody in handcuffs. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, 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 again, shows that, that they have the general powers, the ability to do more than just issue speeding tickets, which like, I've only had one speeding ticket in my life. And that was in Illinois, and I was going like 100 miles an hour and like a 70 mile an hour zone. But in my defense, it was flat and it was just cornfields. Um, High Patrol came out of cornfield, like it was kind of hidden back in a cornfield, which I thought was unfair. I'm like, give me a sporting chance, right? And he pulls out and like he doesn't even turn on his lights. I just pull over because I'm like, well, you got me, right? Like, th th whatever. And so he, pulled, he, he turns on his lights uh, after he's gotten behind me. Then he turns on his lights. Um, he gets out and he, he, he laughs. He goes, well, so I guess you know what you did. And I was like, yep. <laughs> um, but he was super nice and I, he reduced my speed. So like my fine wasn't as big, uh, but you know, I'm, I'm still a little salty about it. Like anytime I drive through Illinois, I get really upset. Um, yeah, I got like, real paranoid. I'm like, where is he? Uh, but, you know, again, it, it, it's police officers, that's one thing that, that you'll learn throughout this course, is they have a lot of discretion. So just because a crime occurs doesn't mean they have to make an arrest. Now, there are some crimes that the state legislature has said, if this crime occurs, you must make an arrest. Right? They don't give them any discretion. But most crimes, virtually all crimes, even if they've witnessed the crime, they've seen the perpetrator, all that jazz, they can decide not to make an arrest. It's entirely within their discretion. Um, and that's especially true, especially when we have county law enforcement and city law enforcement. State law enforcement, again, they're pretty well delineated, um, but they have a lot of discretion, right? And so they can say, yeah, you run 100, and then you knocked it down to like five over. Um, so we, it, 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 they have a lot, a lot of discretion, um, and most use it very well. Um, those who don't do well with their discretion um, kind of lead us to the point where we're at now uh, with um, inequality and, and, and policing and, and things along those lines. Um, all right, so you have people who use their discretion for good and say, oh, you're just a kid doing something dumb. I'm going to scare the hell out of you and just let you go. Uh, whereas you have other police officers in that same situation might say, no, 
I'm taking him to jail. He's going to get prosecuted, right? It, it's really just officer dependent and kind of the, the, the culture. And we'll talk about in one of our later lectures, the culture of policing. Um, then we have county law enforcement. So in, um, if you're still on campus, it's the Shimon County Sheriff's Department, right? So what's interesting is we start to see a break here, right? Federal law enforcement, they go through a hiring process. They're appointed technically, but they go through a hiring process. State police also go through a hiring process. County law enforcement, specifically the sheriff, is elected. He's an elected official, right? So that being said, most states don't have any requirements for somebody to become a sheriff. Like you don't have to have peace officer training um, to be elected to be sheriff. In fact, Missouri, uh, where I'm from, my county that I lived in, um, the coroner, the coroner, think about this, the coroner was elected. And my question was like, how is that person gonna abuse their power, right? It, all they do is deal with dead people. Um, but we, in the time that I lived there, never elected a doctor as coroner. Uh, we elected one time a guy who ran a pizza shop as coroner. Um, and like, we actually had a murder that year and he had to talk about time of death and things like that. And everybody was like, no. No, we don't just stop talking. Um, but yeah, we elect sheriffs, right? Now, the sheriff is primarily responsible for maintaining the county jail, right? So each county is going to have a jail. Uh, that's where you're going to go, um, where you're going to await, going to, um, going to court um, to get bail and all that jazz. Right? Or if you get sentenced for a misdemeanor to imprisonment, you're going to go to the county jail, and that's where you're going to serve your sentence. So you're not going to go to a prison for misdemeanor. Right? For a felony, you will. Um, so they maintain the county jail. They're responsible for general law enforcement. They're also court personnel. So anybody in the courts, um, like the, the, the bailiffs, they are sheriff's deputies. And in s most states, they also serve civil process. And what that means is um, notification that you're being sued, right? So we've all seen that, that, that model of, um, you know, somebody like handing somebody a document saying, you've been served, right? That's what they do. Um, that being said, I was served like two days ago by my ex and it was like, a random dude that had nothing to do with the police off department. Like he had his own little business of just serving people. Um, and it was nice. And like, I was a little disappointed because he didn't say you've been served. He was just handing me the papers. He's like, there you go. I was like, thanks. And he left. And like, I feel a little cheated and a little robbed, but you know, I'll cross that bridge when I come to it with my therapist. And finally, we have city law enforcement, right? So again, El Elmira, Elmira Police Department. Now, city law enforcement may or may not exist depending on the type of city or town. What we mean by this is there are, again, especially in Missouri, um, there were, it was not uncommon to drive down the interstate and see population signs, right? You know, like, oh, welcome to Wellsville, um, population 13. They didn't have local law enforcement uh, because there's 13 people that live there and they were all related. Uh, that it would just be ridiculous to try to police 13 people. Like that's just a waste. Uh, so, you know, it, it just depends on the, the type and city of uh, the city or town. Uh, generally speaking, city law enforcement is responsible for ordinance or minor violations. Um, so, they, they can pull you over for speeding in the city limits. Um, their jurisdiction ends at the city limit. Uh, they can ding you for different ordinance violations, right? I was driving earlier and I saw the parking enforcement guy out measuring um, a wheel to a curb. And I was just like, dude, really? There's nobody else here. Like, just let it go. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, he ended up writing the person that take it because that light took forever to change. Um, again, minor violations, right? So they're not usually going to investigate the big things, right? The big things are going to be county law enforcement. Um, deputies aren't elected. Sheriffs appoint deputies, so you kind of have to keep that in mind. Um, and then again, state law enforcement, especially when the statute says that state law enforcement has to do their job, has to investigate or has to prosecute. So if we look at jurisdictional distribution of law enforcement, most law enforcement are city, suburban, and county, right? So this is where I say they kind of we combine sometimes city and county into one. So 81% of law enforcement officers belong to city or county policing, police departments, right? Sheriff's departments or, or city police departments. That's the bulk. Um, so if your goal is to become a police officer, but you want to be a deputy or you want to be a town police officer, your odds are very good. I, I mean, assuming you, you meet all the requirements, right, um, of getting that. State police represent 10% of all law enforcement. So if your goal is to become a trooper, you're going to have to work for it, right? So it's not uncommon that you go to city or county police for a few years, um, earn your stripes, literally, and um, transfer to the state police. Then the smallest portion of the puzzle is the federal law enforcement, right? Even though we have all kinds of like alphabet soup for them, where you have that list, right, of, of, of just some of federal agencies, uh, they only make up 9%. So I, I have a lot of students who say they want to become FBI agents. And my answer is always, well, best of luck, right? Um, only 9% of, of law enforcement are uh, make up the, the, the distribution. Um, and of that, right, FBI has, is also mixed in with DHS, the Marshals, the ATF, DEA, right? So it's a very, very small sliver. Um, that being said, we did have a student who um, got into uh, the FBI internship program, which if you are interested in, in law enforcement, I encourage you to do, to apply for it. Um, there's like thousands of applications and of it, they accept, I think it's like 50 interns. And we had one uh, go and, and, and do his internship in counterterrorism. Like, I mean, he got fingerprinted, he did all that stuff, he worked in counterterrorism. And he was so great that uh, after the internship ended, the FBI asked him to stay on um, in the local office, basically in Corning, um, and work there. And so he did. Um, we had a tough time with him because at my urging, he wanted to go to law school, um, but the FBI also made him a job offer, right? Of like, as long as you can like compete or complete the, the physical requirements, you, you have a job. Um, we ultimately kind of brokered that he would go to law school and then he would, um, the job offer would still be open for him. So he, he, could, he could make that transition. Um, so again, it's, it's great. We have a good track record. The FBI likes Elmira College. So um, if that's something that, that's, that's a goal of yours, I highly encourage you to look up their summer internship program. Um, the last thing we're going to talk about is just private sector policing. So, um, stemming from policing roots, private, private policing is not a new concept, right? Think about the thief takers. Um, we estimate that in the United States, there are 2 million private police uh, working as security guards, store detectives, and bounty hunters. Okay? Um, often we see partnerships between public sector police and private sector police. Uh, one, another class uh, later in the term, you're gonna have to ask me about store detectives um, and which stores you, sh you, know, you shouldn't shoplift. But like some stores like you really don't wanna shoplift in, other ones like, okay, whatever, they don't care. Um, yeah, and, and, then, and I'll, I'll go through that with you. Um, 
Now, we have to compare public sector police to a vigilante, right? So theoretically, security guards, detectives, bounty hunters, they detain people legally until police get there to make the arrest or, 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 or they take them to court, whatever. A vigilante is somebody that takes the law into their own hands. Now, this was common in the United States from the 1760s through the early 1900s, right? Again, we didn't have a lot of law enforcement and it was kind of a, you took the law into your own hands. You were the judge and jury, right? Um, that is illegal um, to a degree. So I have put links here for you to click. Um, one is about Bernard Goetz. He uh, basically rode the New York subway uh, with a gun like for several hours for a few days because at the time, um, New York subway was, was pretty dangerous. Um, and so he was just waiting to get robbed. And, and so one, one of his little trips, uh, this group of basically kids approach him and, and try to rob him and he shoots him. Um, and he gets arrested. But most, it was interesting, most New Yorkers, like it was New York City, like they, they, they thought him, he was a hero, right? Um, he became a, a, a point of contention in the United States. Um, uh, where people saw him as a hero, but they also said, wait, you were trying to kill someone. Um, we don't like that, right? So that's kind of the illegal vigilante. The legal vigilante um, is another link that I have here for you to a video um, about the Minuteman Project. So what it basically is, is a group of people who um, live on the southern border uh, and they patrol the southern border. And their job basically is when they see, if they see somebody who's coming over the border, right, not the right way, like somebody undocumented coming over the border, they report the position, they follow the person and they report the position to um, immigration and then immigration officers come and, or, and border patrol officers come, make the arrest or, or, or detain the person and, and go from there. Um, so they don't generally carry guns. Um, I know there has been an issue before um, with a, a Minuteman person being killed and an immigrant being killed by a Minuteman person. Um, so again, that's that's where we kind of talk about like it gets dangerous, right? Um, because there there's a very fine line between illegal and legal vigilantes. So the next lecture, we are going to look, uh, now we've covered the history of policing, we're going to look at the structure and the functions of policing. Thank you so much and have a great day.